Welcome back to our coverage. Uh, look back in the past for, to, at the 1994 uh, professional chess association match between Boris Gulko and Nigel Short. After the uh, wins in game two, back and forth wins in game two and three uh, from Short and Gulko respectively, uh, the chess match became a battle of attrition with seven straight draws. Here in game four, the Gulko with the white pieces, Short with the black pieces, uh, against the English, which uh, Short had uh, lost to in the brutal one-move blunder after playing c4, e5, decides to play a, a Carol Slav uh, open, uh, defense, which is uh, c6 against the English. And after e4, game transposed into a Rubenstein uh, Nimzo Indian. But this was drawn after 34 moves. Back to the Carol Khan in game five. Again, uh, Gulko did not deviate uh, from his opening even uh, after his loss. He just merely uh, improved. He played the same line and went right back uh, into it again. His knight h3, which was a novelty uh, in game three. But this time, uh, uh, Boris Gulko was ready. They didn't take any unnecessary risk. And again was able to uh, draw in 49 uh, moves. Gulko with the white pieces. Game 6. Again, same variation from uh, Nigel Short as black. This transposed into a Slav. Uh, exchange variation. That's what's fantastic about the English. Many transpositional uh, possibilities and uh, favors the uh, experienced player. So here, um, uh, the first time in game uh, four, Goko had opted for e4 here. And again, the game wound up becoming a Nimzo Indian. Here, after c6, Goko plays d4 this time. And then Nigel just went for the Slav. Super solid Goko. Just play the exchange variation, and this game was drawn very quickly. Game 7, back to the Carol Khan, and we see Nigel putting, putting forth great effort uh, to win, but this is a hard nut to crack. Again, same exact line, was not able to crack Goko's uh, defenses. Another short draw from Goko. This time he didn't play the exchange, but nevertheless, this game ended in the draw in 12 moves. So, so in the last two uh, attempts with the white pieces, Goko practically, for all intents and purposes, made no attempt uh, accepting short draws. And I'm thinking that perhaps he was getting tired because his black games were marathons and this is the strategy uh, sometimes younger players you use against older players. They just try to tire them out. This is game nine. Again, Carol Khan. And now Nigel finally frustrated with the, uh, I'm not going to say frustrated. I don't want to put uh, intentions on him. But obviously he had been beating his head against the wall against this. Uh, let's go back here. He had been beating his head against the wall with this variation that Gulko had been uh, playing. You know, over and over and over again and not able to uh, achieve any, uh, you know, any progress. He finally switches back to the advanced variation. Okay. And Gulko is, again, like, you know, very well prepared. And, um... All for a battle ensued. And this game was also drawn after 66 moves. So it seemed like Short is pushing. Pushing. The game's been going 50, 60 moves. Goko keeps drawing, drawing. But then with the white pieces, it seems that Goko has no energy to press with white when it's his turn. Because he's fighting so hard to stay alive with the white, with the uh, black pieces. This brings us to game 10. Goko uh, did not accept a short draw here. He actually tried to win this game. 
in this variation of the Slav with uh, A6. But again, this game petered out to a draw also. So we had seven draws in a row. This brings us to game 11. Nigel Short has the black pieces. Goko the white pieces. And guess what opening was played? You guessed it. The Carol Khan. Remember, this is a 12-game match. So the stakes are, are very tense at this point. They have seven draws in a row. It's tied up. And there's only two games left. Short has the white pieces. And he's going for it. Again, he chooses the advanced variation. So... He must have liked his chances better with the advanced variation than going into the other one. And we're going to look at this game. This is where we're going to stop and look. So after knight h4, um, bishop takes b1 is played and rook takes b1. And now c6. Nigel plays a3. Knight bc6. And the knight looks a little bit misplaced on, by the way, on h4. After bishop takes b1, you know, that knight is going to have to be uh, redirected at some times. This is why I really don't like this move, knight g6. Because I think you should wait as long as possible. So that Nigel has to make some type of decision what he's going to do with that, uh, with that knight. But... The knight is covering two of the squares that black kind of wants to go to. So, I mean, do you really want to go like there just to um, uncover something on the knight? Perhaps not. You know, but maybe wait one more move, perhaps. Maybe play C takes D4 or something like that. So knight G6, knight takes, H takes. Yeah, it's good for black. H file is open, so the rook is just automatically developed. Bishop E3. C takes, C takes, bishop e7, g3, queen d7, and now b4, here's the expansion on the uh, queen side, f5, e takes, g takes, h4, and um, I like white's position here. Um, black's position seems a little, you know, a little bit more difficult to play. White has a little bit more space on the queen side. And his pawn structure, you know, I like it a little bit better along with the two bishops. Because those pawns on um, the sixth rank, um, you know, look like they're vulnerable uh, to attack. And once one of them gets provoked forward, it seems like it'll leave all type of weakness in the uh, black position. So case in point right here. Now you have F5, this stonewall looking structure. The dark squares immediately become exposed. So now if white trades off the dark square bishops, because uh, let's mention that white's dark square bishop on E3 is in fact his bad bishop. If he gets rid of that bishop, um, then he will be leaving him, um, relieving himself of a bad piece and then... Uh, the dark squares, Gould Colt's dark squares will be exposed. Because then you just smack that queen on the dark squares. And then um, I think black will have real trouble. So I think that's one of the one of the, the plans going forward for white. Is to try to exchange those bishops somehow. Dark square bishops that is. Queen d2. Bishop f6. So what does Gould Colt do? He puts the pressure on d4. So it makes it harder, to, you know, for playing a move, for, you know, it makes it harder for white to play a move like bishop g5, for instance, trading off the pieces. King f1, queen g7. Some more pressure, but Nigel, oh, sorry about that. Bishop b5. So exploiting the fact that the king is, um, you know, hasn't committed anywhere. So now the knight is pinned by the bishop. This takes the pressure of d4. g5. Rook to c1. Rook c8. Rook g1. g takes. g takes. Queen f7. And now you see the strategy. Voila. 
Bishop G5. So he did all that to, to alleviate the pressure with Bishop, you know, Bishop B5. All of it was the plan to trade off the dark square bishops. Alleviate the pressure on D4 first. This kept White, this kept Nigel from doing what he wanted to do. All that pressure on D4. A6, you already know what's going to happen. Once I told you the plan, you already know he's tra he's going to trade the light square bishop for the knight. Rook takes and give black some pawn weakness to boot. This is this, my friends, is what Nemzovich was talking about. A strong master must content himself with the accumulations of small advantages. Okay, this is how you play chess. Okay, it's not trying to get checkmate every move or, or fork, fork the king and queen every move or a skewer or something like that. It's the accumulation. This is how masters play. You don't see games decided between masters just, um, oh, he hung his queen. You know, that's why it's a big deal in the chess world. When you see a GM make a one move blunder and lose, that makes, you know, chess based news, you know, immediately. Like, oh, such and such hung, you know, hung a queen or, you know, uh, lost on time because it's so rare that it's, it's, it's a big surprise. This is usually how it's done. It's the accumulation of small advantages. In order for you to get better at chess, you must understand what the advantages are that you're trying to accumulate. Here's one of them right here. You have look at all the backward pawns. Okay? Look at the colors. Under look at the pawns the colors are on. I look at this position and in my eyes, white is winning already. This is to me, this is close to winning already for white. Because I see the weakness on the dark squares. I see the backward pawns. I see the outposts on e5, c5, and a5. Okay? That that alone that's too much advantage. Now what is white now what does black have to compensate for those advantages I just mentioned? Nothing. Black has no kind of attack. Anything. Um the king's safety is probably equal. Like, you know, both kings are kind of wandering a little bit. But only um, thing black has really is this pressure on d4, but I don't feel that it's enough. And there's some pressure on um, on h4 from the rook, but I think black's white's advantages are are, are is overwhelming. You know these weak pawns, the the uh, a pawn, the c pawn, e pawn. It's too much. Queen f4 now, right? What is Queen F4 doing? It's challenging. It's, it's threatening to penetrate via the dark squares. Remember, I was telling you how weak the squares are. So basically, I guess what I'm trying to get into your heads out there is that, and if you know this already, forgive me. But for the people that's learning, what I'm trying to get into your heads is that you base your plans on the features of the position. You can't do any more than that. This is basically, um, you know, culmination of Steiner's theory, right? You gotta you gotta play where the weaknesses are. So if the weaknesses are on the dark squares, you gotta uh, you gotta start when you start formulating your plan. It has to be having something to deal with the dark squares. So you look, hmm, the dark squares are weak, and I'm of course I'm just using one factor in the game because normally in chess there's a whole bunch of factors. It could be like weak squares, uh, backward pawns, isolated pawns, and not only does your opponent have weaknesses, but you have your own weaknesses, and you're so you're putting all of these together and making a plan, you know. And you have to determine tactics and all this stuff. This is what makes chess fascinating. But let's look at it just from the simple point of view. Dark squares are weak. He has dark square bishop. Then you say, hey, if I eliminate dark square bishops, I can and put my queen on the dark squares, right? Because that's the only piece that we have left that can really exploit uh, those squares, you know, a long distance piece. Then you say, hmm. I'll have, I'll have a better position. All his pawns are on light squares. So therefore, the plan, eliminate dark squares. Excuse me, eliminate the dark square bishop. As simple as that. King d7. <coughs> so he stops he stops the queen from penetrating. Right? Uh, via uh, b8. Guess what the next move is? Eliminate the dark square bishop. <laughs> queen takes f6. Now, okay... White has to deal with the issue of d4 and h4. How do you deal with that? Okay. There's it's two ways, really, you could deal with it. One is play rook g5, which is playing the game. The other is play h5. Because you can you can say, you know what? I'm not messing with this pawn. I'm going to just give it up. Now you say, give it up. Yes, give it up. Because 
the compensation. Now, I'm sorry, not rook, rook to e8. Queen b8. You get access to the back rank. So, again, that's another thing with pawns. Anytime you're giving up pawns, compensation. There got to be some kind of compensation or you just down material. But basically, this is winning right here. So, not going to get into it, but this is winning for uh, for white. So those are two ways. Anyway, Nigel played a practical move. He just blocked the action of the queen by playing rook g5. Queen h6. So he's threatening threatening to uh, win the pawn again. But now, Nigel plays queen g3. So basically, he's using tactics to protect the uh, his asset on h5 because rook g7 is threatened. Rook e8, right? Uh, of course, to meet rook g7 with rook e7. King e2, improved the king position. Queen f6, trying to distract with d4. And now he uses his king to protect the uh, d4 pawn. Now here's a good move from um, Gulko. Right? He plays f4 so that the light squares can be opened up for his queen to penetrate. Because remember, both kings are a little, their position a little drafty. Rook h8. And now h5. Rook f8, h6, and now it's pretty much over at this point, after even like rook g7. Now to play rook g6, queen f5, queen takes, rook takes, and now rook g7, king d7, a7. And the game went on for another 38 moves. I'll just go through real quick, but, but um, you know, just try to hold on. But this position, like I said a long time ago, is strategically... Um, busted for uh, white. I'm I'm sorry. Busted for black. And even with these like little threats that black is trying to make, he can't go anywhere because that h7 pawn has to be watched. Say for instance, look at here. Like even Nigel had a chance. Nigel just took this pawn. Now of course that could be played, but then you know b5. And the B goes on. <clears throat> so here he decides to throw in uh, Gulko plays F3. Check. King E3. Takes. Takes. And now he takes the pawn. But again, B5. So, okay, you got the H pawn. But now the A or B pawn is going to rock. But value defense. Tactics again with the... <laughs> prevailing with these pawns. Can't take the rook. Rook C4. Again, you take that pawn, I'll take this pawn. And Nigel made it a little harder than it had to be. But nevertheless, he found a way. Again, why not just rook takes f3? That way, when the check comes, you got both pawns guarded. Like, for, Not that he would do that, but I'm just saying. A pawn and f pawn is guarded. Well, who knows? It could be time scramble or what what have you. So King takes F3, and notice the difference. Now he could just t he could pick up the uh, A pawn. Again, technique, little issue there. King D5, but this is winning also. It's um you know you set up the uh, and this is positions you should know, like Lucena position, pawn um going up the board, and it's important too to uh, make sure that Black's king is cut off. From that sixth rank, so that he cannot achieve the um, the Philidor defense. If you don't know what that is, go look look at my videos and and learn those uh, defenses in these type of end games. So White makes sure that um, Gulko cannot reach that position. And he keeps him keeps the king stuck on the fifth rank. And I'm just showing you the ending because it's destructive. King G2, King H6. So you see here. Goko's trying to construct this defense based on keeping the king away from escorting the pawn, right? But now after rook e2, he's just threatening because the the uh, if the pawn moved, then um, the king would take on uh, e6. So rook e2 does two things. It keeps the king cut off on the d file and allows the uh, pawn to move on the f file. So Goko can't afford to keep the king cut off now, so he has to attack the pawn. Once he attacks the pawn, this frees up Nigel's king, coming to g6. 
he checks again, but no way is he going to go back into the prison. I mean, he could repeat if he wanted to. If he wanted to just play some games, he could go back to H5 because the then he would repeat. But king is free now. King F7. Notice how the black king is cut off by one file. He needs to be cut off uh, um, some more. So king F6, king D6, F6, king D7. King F8, king D8. And now here's the opportunity. And the reason why he has to follow the king is because Say if, say if Goku did a move like that, then this king can, you know, have access, just come out here. Of course, he wouldn't do that first. You play F7 first. And let's just play like a, and let's say he came back there. Not that move. Let's, um, trying to just do something stupid here. Um. A king d5. Then the king would be able to slip out. Okay, and promote. So that's the whole idea. So, Goku shadowing the king so that the king cannot slip out. Because the rook has the g-file, so there's no way Short can bring his king out here to promote the pawn. And the black king is guarding on the e-file. So, how to get this pawn advance? Well, you have to check the king out of the way. So, first he advances... And now, this is far as Google can go, right? Or he'll be off the board, right? So King D8. So now, Rook D2. This pawn having control of E7 forces the king to have to go back. And so there's that cutoff. And now F7. King C8. Of course, he could have resigned already, but he doesn't. He wants to make sure Nigel knows the position. So this is called building a bridge. He brings the rook back to the um, fifth rank. King c7. Now the king can come out. Okay, so there's checks. King f6. And now um, Goku decides to um, to uh, resign here. The idea is basically after uh, rook f1 check, then just simply rook f5. This guy is going to queen. And the king is too far away to step in and stop it. And this rook is attacked. So, for example, rook takes, king takes, boom. And then, of course, queen. And then that's that's it. So, Goku resigned. So that, for all intents and purposes, um, game 11 uh, ended uh, the match there. But there was one more game, game 12. And... Um, Goku came out with his English again. And this time, Nigel Short switched it up for the first time and played uh, something different. Not for the first time, but he, he switched it up again. He was playing uh, C6 in response to C4. He tried E5, and then he switched to C6. And then in this last game, he played E6. And what he did was bring it into a solid Queen's Gambit decline. He's already in the, um, in the league. And he only needs a draw to win. So he plays Queen's Gambit to decline. Goku plays exchange variation. This is a variation Short has been playing for years. Queen F3 and allows this double pawns. But the heavy pieces come off the board. And he just got to make sure he plays correct. This is like a little deficiency in the pawn structure. But Nigel has the bishop here. In um, you know, in compensation for the damaged pawn structure. So again, always look for compensation when you have you just don't take on defects with no compensation. And uh, Goku put you know some type of effort in. And Nigel trades everything, and now basically, um, Nigel. Doesn't really have any compensation for his pawn structure, but his pawn structure is not really that critical. Um, it's really the only weakness in the position, so he's not in danger of of losing. You know, he has just enough count. He has enough counterplay to whereby uh, White can't really um, wage any serious threats. With this move, he straightens out his pawns. Now he has even he even has more space in the position. 
And if he wanted to, he could, Nigel could actually press this position. Right here, he's in deep trouble, uh, Gulko, with the uh, white pieces. So after King F2, Nigel actually played H6 here. And uh, the game was agreed drawn. But like I said, black stands better in this position. Okay, so with that, that is our story. It ends the match uh, of uh, in 1994 between uh, Nigel Short and Boris Gulko. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I'll be looking at some more uh, matches. Uh, and if you have any suggestions or anything you want to see, just let me know. And uh, we'll, you know, we'll try to uh, accommodate. All right. So please like and subscribe. Donate if you if you can. You have some spare change. And, um, you know, I'll see you on the next one. We're going to keep going.